Dear organizers of the summit, thank you for inviting me here in Uppsala. And Royal Highness and dear honorable participants, thank you to join from all over the world and to also not only listen to me, but also really I'm looking forward to join you in the workshops to think together about how um, urban childhoods can be more healthy. Um, I'm not so eloquent as my previous speakers, I think. Uh, so I start with a joke, I thought. Uh, it can be cut out of the live stream eventually, if it's a bad one. So I'm Jens Arts. I'm um, from Belgium. I have a Swedish name and just wanted to share with you why I have a Swedish name or Scandinavian name. Um, my mother, she played tennis and she was actually in love with Bjorn Borg. So that's why she gave me a Swedish name. My brother is called Sven, so it was really a very deep love from her for uh, this famous Swedish tennis player. Um, but actually, I'm an urban specialist at UNICEF, the United Nations Children's Fund, where I can work with health specialists, child rights specialists, to define new ways for UNICEF to work in cities. UNICEF has not really a legacy to have been working in cities. They're more known to work in emergencies or in rural environments. So for them, working in cities is actually a new domain. And it's very interesting to... Um, to develop with them also a discourse like how can we translate child rights to cities and to urban planners that they understand that child rights is also about urban planning and that urban planners and cities can do a lot. And I wrote, uh, I authored a book last year with uh, a lot of specialists that uh, we gathered to make this translation from child rights to urban planning. Uh, in, um, and there's flyers in the, available for you where you can download it. I only have one hand, handbook, hard copy. You already guess who I will give it to uh, after the football experience. Um, but So I also learned that if you want to make um, a case for children, you have to also start with the dramatic um, things. So you have to develop a bit from a bad, uh, from the negative uh, way. That's what we learned from journalists. Um, and I, I just took some pictures from where I've been lately or where I go. And you see like the, the world that we are developing now with actually quite some infrastructure investments. They just, they, do, they don't look at neighborhoods where children can live. You, you cannot imagine actually where children can play or walk independently and have a healthy lifestyle. And, and, and so that's really a problem that we have, seems like as urban planners and cities have forgotten actually what it is about. And um, so that's a bit the start of the, the research we did. We listed a bit similar like what also Yun Habitat said, we listed actually all the major vulnerabilities of children related with the spatial uh, uh, constellation of cities. And we, we grouped them in three ways uh, that are referring to typically child rights language. It's the vulnerability related to health of children, the vulnerability related with protection of children, the vulnerability related with um, uh, participation. And so spatial equity and spatial uh, issues really are very determinant for uh, these child rights uh, components. And um, for example, for UNICEF, it's very important now, not only from an advocacy point, but also from Let's do programming. It's not only about now raising awareness. Everybody knows that air pollution is so bad, but we, we know we have to still emphasize this uh, advocacy and, and raise awareness with data that every year nearly 600,000 children under the age of five die from diseases caused of exacerbated by the effects of indoor and outdoor air pollution. This is enormous. And so we are, are developing more and more programs uh, in that way. Um, more from a protection point of view is the issue of road safety. It hasn't been mentioned so much, but for, for it's very clear that we have to really work on this road safety because children don't have a safe journey to school. And, and actually it's also mostly something for adolescents. So you, you try to have children raising, getting a healthy life, and then actually there's so many uh, 
uh, adolescents actually that die in, in road safety accidents or they get heavily injuries and have very difficulties to, to get uh, a, le a decent uh, job later on. So this is something we want to work on. Um, and we are doing advocacy on this uh, in the Child Health Initiative and with uh, some foundations. And then thirdly, also from the participation perspective, of course, you, you see that cities are not all very accessible. Not all services are accessible. There's really a lot of city parts that um, where, where you don't have access to services, and so there's also a kind of isolation uh, within uh, cities that um, makes it very difficult for children to raise their voice, but also simply get engaged into civic life and, and gain civic trust and to be part of, of the city. Now the positive side, I think that's also very important to highlight if we want to emphasize why urban planning is so important, is that if you look at the latest science, how important the first 1,000 days are in brain development. And it's related with love of your caretaker, your parents, but also with play. So that's something that's very important for us to use as a, as a, as a, as a language to to the cities and the urban planners. This is very important. It's not enough planned. This uh, small, very prox proximity-related uh, spaces for children. And also another um, thing that we have to think about is that if you look at how the model splits, so the transportation division in between cars and uh, walking is, that you see that in developing cities, actually there's still like 40% is actually called non-motorized transportation, so it's walking, maybe biking, and that decreases enormously if you go to developed cities. So if you want to, if we want to save the planet, then we have to really invest into that the developing cities that they don't lose this percentage. Yeah? So we have to emphasize that uh, public transportation walkability is so important because children are the ones they learn what we we teach them or they they do what is offered to them so we have to really invest into uh, seeing them as actually the future the 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 drive the, the i always say the carless drivers instead of the driverless cars and that's very important to see children as 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 the future in transportation and the same also with working around waste management if you if you look at the predictions about how much waste there will be generated in new cities mostly in lower middle income and middle income then you know you have to work with the city the children and the communities to that they are the ones that have to be um, as sustainable as possible. And another positive thing is that you see a lot of cities that are historic and that really have this scale of the neighborhood, the scale of people, not necessarily all playgrounds, but places where children and their parents can meet, where you have multi-generational, very informal dynamics, for example, in Guangzhou, where I just took this picture and I, I thought it's amazing, like where you feel like children have the time to be with their parents after school, to talk about what happened in school, to just do normal things. That's something we should try to bring back into s cities, large cities and smaller c cities. So the, the handbook we made was, is actually kind of throwing out a voice of UNICEF, that child rights is something that we have to work all together uh, for. And we see it also very clear that there's not like the urban planner. Eh? It's like we have a lot of urban stakeholders that we have to influence. And, and we, we feel like children and communities are part of that. And we have now been uh, developing the hand, promoting the handbook everywhere. It's now translated in Chinese also. It's going to be translated in Spanish soon. So we hope to really uh, give comfort to urban planners and cities to take up that role um, that they have for creating child-responsive urban settings. Um, we have developed a kind of uh, simple message about 10 principles, and I will just go through them. Uh, the first principle is actually to, to, to look at how urban planning is happening now and to just emphasize that some aspects in urban planning could be done better. And we see like there's three things. There's the planning of urban spaces, of course, that has to be much more granular, small scale, proxim uh, the proximity of, is very important for children, but also the spatial equity in street distribution, that there's enough space for walking, etc. 
Secondly, to really engage children in the design process. That's also been mentioned. It's children and communities, they know best what are the issues. They know best, actually, what are solutions. But we might not always be comfortable to work with children, of course. That's something we have to emphasize. We have to develop better guidelines about how we do this. And thirdly, also, we have to much better have data around uh, children and also the relation between the built environment and the, the impact on in, in terms of health and uh, safety, for example. Um, there is some guidelines coming up, and I agree with the former um, speaker, actually. Guidelines is not enough. We have to go to norms and standards. Because it's true, everywhere you go, you see like someone has been designed wrong. So that it has to do with norms and standards. We really have to go into that space. But it's very promising that there's a lot of guidelines now coming out that really target the design and the urban planning um, schools and, and uh, community, and that really targets on children. In participation, we should go very quickly into developing guidelines also that uh, we know how, how, how you can participate with children. So, for example, these are workshops that we are doing now where we, uh, we, where we invite urban planners to work with children and to give them a sort of comfort to, to really work with children during a whole week and to design, redesign actually their neighborhood. This is in China, in uh, Ningbo. And also in terms of data, to try to use actually open data and um, geospatial data to really look at, or more like, um, let's say, GIS-based or like more uh, community-based information to map it and to determine actually where are the priorities of investment into public spaces or, uh, or other um, services for children. So in the book, we have developed 10 principles. This was the first principle, is to actually highlight that urban planning is important, that urban planning can be more child responsive. And then we did uh, a screening of like, what could you do, for example, for housing? And for in housing, you see a lot of density, more and more, that's good. But often these outdoor spaces, they are not so interesting. And they are like a bit landscaped or decoration. And we see like a lot of promising practice, and that's something we want to emphasize, to actually use these outdoor spaces, or also the collective spaces in the buildings to increase physical activity and uh, multi-generational um, meeting spaces and opportunities. Second, um, a third principle is um, to really invest much more into community centers and youth centers. Um, not only the school is important, but also uh, youth hubs, for example, where these places also become platforms for other things. It's not only to meet other children, but also to have maybe some engagement or raising awareness or connection about health issues, about mental health issues, etc. This is, for example, a uh, youth hub that uh, UNICEF has installed in Tacloban in the Philippines after um, the hurricanes. And these, these centers are done also with children, so they are built with communities and they're very resilient. They're very, very central now in their communities. Of course, public spaces is, is an obvious one, uh, but I, I wanted to show this, like you see this is a big park, but there wasn't a playground. So these things are, are actually quick wins that uh, can be assessed in high income and low income countries to see whether uh, parks actually are efficiently used and playable, uh, very important for children. And then on transportation, we have uh, recently started a, a road safety program. It's called the Child Road Traffic Injuries Prevention Program. And there we use um, the program to, to look at school environments and to uh, develop around the school sustainable mobility plans and also, again, train urban planners in the cities. Um, this one is in Manila, in Philippines, how they can develop sustainable mobility plans and ensure uh, better uh, school, safer and healthy school environments. I see I'm running out of time, so I'm going to ver go very quickly. Also in water and waste management, what's important, I think, is to also look at how you can design places of water infrastructure in a more engaging way. So this, for example, is in Medellin, where you have these uh, water installations that usually are very fenced 
and outside of the city. But nowadays, more and more, they're inside the cities and to create them as public spaces where children can play but also have be very connected with these meshes that water is very valuable and it's a central spot in the, in the space, in the cities. And then in urban food environments, also very important to see schools as platforms where you where you bring in healthy food in the schools, not only where they can eat it, but also they can learn how to grow it. Very important. Um, we have this, this, uh, this week we have the launch of our flagship report, uh, the state of the world of children, and it's about uh, food and nutrition. And I'm very happy that there's a chapter around urbanization that exactly talks about this new issue, not only under nutrition, what UNICEF used to work on, but also on obesity and uh, the, the lack of access to, to healthy food. And then um, also on waste is something that we think we have to work on because children are so exposed to it. They are the ones that play in the streets. That they are the ones that are hanging around because there's often no really dedicated places for play. So they're very vulnerable for waste. And, but they're also with the communities, with their parents, the ones that can come up with solutions of starting uh, recycling in cities where it's not existing yet or in situations like slums where it's not easy to come in with like a big provider. So they are often the solution uh, to start waste manage management projects in cities. Also on energy, there's um, a lot happening to, to try to measure better air pollution. And so this is a project I like a lot. It's from my own country. Uh, I have to admit it, but it's, um, it's a, a citizen science project where 2,000 um, citizens actually start measuring on the facade where they live. So it's a very local uh, data you get about air pollution in cities. And of course, this creates a, gr a great um, agenda for politicians then to be forced actually to do to, to something about this. And then finally, I want to conclude with also um, the last principles about data and ICT. Use data and ICT for engaging with children. They're all gaming, they're all playing with their, their games, but they really want to do something purposeful with this. And so here we are working with you and Habitat actually um, to, to set up participatory design of public spaces uh, with children. I just come to the end that we are now developing in UNICEF an urban strategy where urban planning is one of the major components, which is also new for UNICEF, as I said, because they used to work more in a rural environment. So urban planning will, not, will be something that UNICEF wants to engage in. And then also we are um, developing our Child Friendly Cities Initiative, which is a very big network of uh, cities that are child friendly, there's five of them in Sweden, but they're more the smaller cities now. So we want to scale up to bigger cities to, to have the leverage of bigger cities to be part of it. And um, so that's my speech and I'm, I'm very happy to be here and to learn more from you also. Thank you. Thank you. Oh. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Question, short comments, we have a little time for that. Yes, please, in the end. Um, thank you very much for this presentation. I'm Matluba Khan, I work in University College London, um, the UK. Um, my question is around, we have talked about guidelines and also tools to uh, tools and standards to implement those guidelines in terms of participation of children in planning and design decisions. I think my concern is when when we consult with children, but then those ideas do not transform into the outcomes. So, in many cases. The ideas generated through participation or consultation do not reflect in the actual outcomes in terms of design and planning decisions. And I fear that there is um, somehow this lack in terms of evaluating whether the participation and the product of the participation was, um, was actually reflective of what children wanted. And what is there in place to monitor that that is happening? Um, I, I don't know whether what 
Uh, I'd like to know your take on, um, on this issue. Thank you. I think it's an, a very good question. I want to highlight that we're just starting this, and I think it's one of the things to do to make good guideline on participation with children in the urban planning context. And part of the guidelines is exactly this. If you make guidelines, you also have to have ways how you measure then that this has had impact and has to be part of the guidelines. It's not just about doing the workshop and feel like everybody has had its say, but also really measure how, how it has been influencing. At the other side, I also want to say, I think uh, even children, I think most, they are not expecting that everything they say is literally going to be translated. It's also a way to explain to children how they can participate and that their ideas are part of a, a bigger idea and bigger propositions. That's also very important to look in both ways. Thank you very much. And of course, a children's book for a planner. Thank you. Good. Ah, Ronya, I... Don't give it to the press. No, no, Ronya, oh, no. I, I looked at it. <laughs> very good. Thank you.